Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, located in Adams County, Pennsylvania, between a smorgasbord of Union generals, including the likes of George Gordon Meade, and his new command of the Army of Potomac, and Confederate Commander-in-Chief Robert E. Lee, and his totality of force that he could assemble under the Army in Northern Virginia. The total number of Union and Confederate troops surpassed 170,000 men. This battle took place over three days, the 1st through the 3rd of July, 1863. First, the sheer size and scope of this battle is large enough that I would never be able to cover even briefly the entire battle. There are far better channels, books, and other sources for the details of the battle, so I won't try to cover it all. However, I will give you a very incredibly too brief version of the battle here, and maybe in the future we'll expand with extras. Gettysburg itself was a small town of about 2,500 people that was a congregation of roads leading into Maryland and Pennsylvania. It comprised the gentle hills, farms, fields, and orchards with various granite outcroppings. Confederate leader Robert E. Lee had led his army north here to try and alleviate the pressure of an invasion by the North on Virginia, and to hopefully disrupt Union campaigns. His hope was to strike a decisive victory, so he brought forward more than 75,000 men. Unfortunately for Lee, he was unaware that Stuart in the Battle of Hanover had moved out of position, leaving his flank open and his battlefield intelligence with holes in it. On June 28th, after his troops were already committed, Lee did learn from a spy that the Union Army of Potomac had a new commander, General George Gordon Meade, and that Meade, along with 95,000 Union troops, were heading towards Lee. Upon hearing this news, two 7,000-man divisions were dispatched to investigate Gettysburg. There, they met Union cavalry pickets and quickly drove the Union cavalry back, slamming into the Union 1st Corps on McPherson Ridge. The Union quickly retaliated and pushed the Confederates back, but the commanding Union officer, Major General John F. Reynolds, was killed in the fight. All sides waited for reinforcements as the afternoon passed. By then, divisions of the 1st Corps arrived west of the town, while Confederate General Ewell's reinforcements approached from the north. By afternoon, the fighting had began again, and it included Confederate Major General Jubal A. Early and Union Major General Winfield Scott Hancock of the Second Corps. The fighting was harsh on Cemetery and Culp's Hill, with Confederates exhausted and Confederate Commander Lee not knowing the entire situation of Union forces, they decided not to continue the attack and instead paused for the evening. By the morning of July 2nd, both armies had fully arrived at Gettysburg, with the armies extending more than two miles between Cemetery Ridge and Culp Hill. The second day entailed many waves of attacks by the Confederates against Union positions, especially at places like Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, and Cemetery Ridge. As the light settled on the evening of the second day of fighting, the Union Army had finally recovered its lost positions, but would feel the losses from this battle for the rest of the war in a very similar way that the Confederate Army would. Even with the staggering losses, the Confederate reinforcements arrived the morning of the third day to refill the meat grind, building the Confederate forces back up to their sizable number. The battle started later in the day on July 3rd as well. The air erupted in a thunder as 200 Confederate cannons unleashed the closest thing to hell this area of the world had seen. The thunder only grew as Union artillery turned fire and for almost three hours, the lead rain beat down upon both sides. The Confederates moved forward even as the artillery had only just stopped, buoyed by Confederate General Robert E. Lee's presence. No amount of morale, however, would protect the Confederate soldiers that crossed open fields. Confederate soldiers were blown apart or vaporized as Union troops opened fire with deadly accuracy and deafening roar of rifles. The center of the fighting at Emmitsburg Road encapsulated the brutality of this fighting. Even when the Confederates reached the Union positions, their numbers had been so devastated they were unable to caused much damage and were unable to take any of the positions. The final example of this was the now infamous Pickett's Charge, which was rebuffed by Union General Hancock. This charge alone is believed to have killed more than 5,700 Confederates, and even the Union themselves lost more than 1,500 troops. The day ended and the battle was over. More than 28,000 Confederate troops were killed, wounded, or missing, while the Union lost more than 23,000 killed, wounded, or missing. The three days had destroyed the lives of more than 51,000 soldiers. While the losses seem a similar payment on both sides, this broke the Confederates, and they would never again have enough forces or ability to project those forces to threaten Washington, D.C., or the North. The final result of this battle was that from this point over, the South would be the battleground. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.